Let's pray again, shall we? Our gracious God and heavenly Father, again we give thanks for your glory. We give thanks, O God, that you have shown the light of the glory of the gospel in the face of Christ into each of our hearts. And Father, it's not by our doing that we have come to know Christ, but you have opened our eyes and you opened the eyes of our hearts. Father, you have, by the power of the Holy Spirit, displayed to us the horror and the ugliness and the defilement of our sin. At the same time, O oh God, you have opened our eyes to the wonderful story of the gospel. And we have come to know Christ and his blood shed for us. Father, we thank you and we praise you that we have been washed clean in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are your adopted children. You are our heavenly father. And Lord, this morning, we just want to bring before you some of our members, some of our number, Lord, who are going through difficult times, those who are just struggling with doubt and fear and discouragement and depression, even loneliness. And Father, we lift them up to you and we cry out to you, O oh God, for your hand to work in their lives. Father, we pray that you would lift their gaze to see Jesus. Father, to see him above and beyond all the troubles and all the difficulties that seem to plague us day in and day out. And Father, help us, we pray, not to be anxious about anything, but to commit everything to you in prayer and petition and thanksgiving. And Father, to know the peace of God that passes all understanding, guarding our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Father, for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, and Lord, we think of a few in particular, and Lord, we cry out to you on their behalf that you would give them comfort and joy and peace in difficult times as they are mourning the loss, grieving the loss of loved ones. Father, we pray that you would heal those hurting hearts and help them through these difficult times. Father, we cry out to you again, as we often do, that you would bring a revival amongst our number. Lord, start with the leadership in this church, and Father, work that revival through the whole church. Father, we cry out to you on this 404th anniversary of the Reformation that started in Europe. Father, we pray that you would bring Reformation into our lives, into this church Father, there would be a renewed zeal for the glory of God, a renewed zeal for the gospel of Jesus Christ, a renewed zeal for prayer and study and meditation on Scripture, a renewed zeal, O God, to make known the gospel to the nations. Father, let us never forget that we have been given a great commission to go out and make known the truth of Jesus Christ to all men and women all over this world. Father, we pray for the furtherance of the gospel. Lord, we look back at other parts of the world and even in our own recent history, and we see how men have tried to stamp out the gospel, and in every effort to stamp it out, the gospel was spread, the, the news was scattered, and it, all over the world, all over those individual countries, the gospel grew. Men and women were saved. The, the church increased and expanded and strengthened. And so, Father, as we look and we realize that persecution is coming in our land, Father, we cry out to you that you would use persecution to scatter the gospel all over Australia. And, Father, that there would be many, many, many souls saved for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray, we cry out to you, O God, for the strength, the grace to stand firm when those difficult days come, when they threaten our security, when they threaten even our own lives and limbs. Father, we ask you for grace to stand, to stand firm no matter what the cost may be. Oh, Lord, we would not deny Christ to save our skin. And Father, we ask you for help. We plead with you, O oh God, that you would work in our lives. Father, we pray again that there would be a great increase in the influence of the Spirit of God in every one of our lives to draw us to live lives that are holy and pleasing to you, to draw us, O oh God, to love the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love each other.
Father, we ask you to do a work in our church. Father, we pray, too, that there would be an increase in the fear of the Lord in all of our hearts. Father, we pray these things often, and we cry out to you, O God, that you would hear and answer our prayers. Father, we would not be simply a Christian country club on a hill that gathers once in a while to to read some good old stories and to sing some hymns we all love and go home completely unchanged. Father, we pray, we cry out to you, O God, for a great work of your Holy Spirit today as we open the Scriptures and study and read. Father, we pray the Spirit of God would work in every single one listening, whether it's over the Internet or here in this room, that we would leave this place changed, not the same that we came in. And Father, we ask you these things in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, I hope you have a Bible still with you, and it's open to the book of Acts and chapter 8. This is, as I mentioned in my prayer, Reformation Sunday, 404 years ago today, October 31st, a short, stocky German monk by the name of Martin Luther marched over to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral, and he took a nail and he drove nails through his 95 theses into the door. And so, the already glowing spark of protest against against Catholicism's errors, that spark which began a hundred years earlier with a man named Jan Hus, leapt into a flame, then a fire, and then a roaring blaze as the Protestant Reformation spread throughout the Christian world. Now, I'd wanted, I'd plan, I hoped to bring a message this morning. I even started to prepare it from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26 on the five solas. Uh, scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone, glory of God alone, in Christ alone. All those five, they're all there in Romans 3, 21 to 26. But as I studied and I worked and I, I labored over the text to try and bring it all together, it just didn't seem to come together the way that I really wanted it to. So I studied and I prayed and I cried out to the Lord for his message that he wanted for us. And as I did so, my five soul of sermon just didn't come together. And rather, he drew my thoughts back to Acts and back to chapters 6 to 8 and today's text of Acts 8, 1 to 25. And I realized The Reformation was not first in the 15th and 16th centuries, but rather it was in the first century. Reformations are times when God does great works amongst his people, most often through devoted prayer, a renewed zeal and return to the study and preaching of the word of God. Stephen, as we saw a few weeks ago, was a man full of the Holy Spirit. He had a tremendous grasp of the Word of God, and as we see from his speech, Stephen and the apostles' preaching was very much an appeal and a protest to the Sanhedrin and the Jews against their apostasy because they rejected God's Word and God's work through the Lord Jesus Christ. God through Christ and then his apostles and godly spirit-filled men like Stephen and Philip and Paul, and later Augustine, and Athanasius, and Jan Hus, and Martin Luther, and John Calvin, and Huldrych Zwingli, God brought reformation to his people. And also for so many others who studied scripture, and prayed fervently, and preached the gospel, God brought reformation and revival all through the history history of the church. And there's still a need for reformation today in our own lives personally. And it comes through prayer and the study and the practice and the preaching of the Word of God. In the 16th century, Erasmus produced a new Greek New Testament. It was part of a scholarly academic movement to return to the studying of the original documents. And so he went back to the original Greek and produced this compilation of the Greek New Testament. And Luther's study of the Bible, particularly Psalms and Romans, led to a rediscovery of justification by grace through faith. 
and that fired the Reformation. There's, there's a great line in one of his uh, writings. R Luther says, he beat importunately against the text. I <laughs> love that phrase. It literally means he sat there and he pounded away at the text of Scripture to understand what it meant. And in that wrestling, that studying, that pounding on the Scriptures, God opened his mind and his heart. <clears throat> and uh, he understood the gospel. He understood afresh what justification by grace through faith literally meant. So you're probably wondering, what has all this got to do with Acts chapter 8? And the answer is preaching, and I'm going to explain in a moment. I want you to notice that Luke writes Acts using a repeated cyclical pattern of events. You can see it easier in the early chapters, not so much in the older, later chapters, but it's still there. The pattern goes like this. First of all, Christian leaders like the apostles and Stephen rise up and preach the gospel. Secondly, listeners are converted and the church grows. And we saw that from Acts 2 all the way to Acts chapter 6. And of course, as the gospel is being preached and people are being changed and, and saved, opposition rises up against those leaders and they begin to persecute them. Uh, the Jews at that time and then later Gentiles as well begin to persecute Stephen and James and Peter and later Paul himself. And the fourth event that happens in this cyclical repeated process is that God intervenes to rescue the leaders and or protect the church for further mission and spread of the gospel. The churches were scattered and whenever they were scattered, they went about preaching. You can see it right in our text. So ask again, what has Acts chapter 8 got to do with the Reformation? And the answer is preaching. You say, where's that? Well, open your Bibles and look down to verse 4, and you'll notice it says, they went everywhere preaching the word. And then verse 5, it says that Philip went to Samaria and preached Christ. In verse 12, it says that Philip preached the things concerning the kingdom of God. In verse 25, it says they testified and preached the word of the Lord. In verse 25, again, it says they returned preaching the gospel. And then in verse 35, which Cam didn't read, we'll read it later, it says that Philip, beginning at this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. They preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. The story of Acts and the Christ's witnesses is a story of preaching. And preaching is not necessarily a, a pulpit and a church and a big voice or a croaky voice like mine right now. It's proclaiming, ministering, making known the truth about Christ. Notice something else here. Preaching brings a response. God works through preaching, and God works for good through gospel preaching. We see that in verses 1 to 3. The gospel preaching brings persecution. Stephen has preached, and now Sir Paul or Saul responds with opposition and persecution. In verses 4 to 8 and 12 to 13, gospel preaching brings conversions. All those people in the Samaritan town that were being saved. Thirdly, in verses 9 to 13, we see that gospel preaching delivers from darkness as the people of Samaria are set free from Simon Magus's overwhelming sort of control and influence in their lives. Fourthly, in verses 14 to 17, we're going to see how gospel preaching brings reconciliation in all this we got to remember this great truth that comes out of Romans chapter 8, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. So first of all, I want us to see that gospel preaching brings persecution. And in verse 54, we saw a few weeks ago 
That Stephen's great speech and his response, the Sanhedrin gnashed their teeth in anger and in unrestrained fury. They dragged Stephen from the city in a violent act of murder, not a legal execution by any stretch. They stoned him to death. God works through gospel preaching to bring persecution. We can see in verse 58 the, the transition in Saul. First, he's minding the clothes of the stoners in verse 58. And then in chapter 8 and verse 51, we see that Saul consenting to Stephen's death. And then in verse 3, we see that Saul is making havoc of the church. Now, that word that Luke uses for havoc is the same for wild beasts that are tearing at fresh meat. Nothing slowed down his fury. He attacked women as well as men. In verse 3 here, we see that he dragged them to prison. In Acts 22 and verse 4, Paul later is telling his own story, and he says he persecuted the church to death. He was literally putting people to death for their faith in Christ. In Galatians 1 verse 13, Paul says he tried to destroy the church. God uses preaching to bring persecution. And God uses persecution for his purposes, for our good and for his glory. It's all through the Bible. In Elijah, in the Old Testament, preached against Baal worship at God's leading, and he was persecuted by Jezebel. Jeremiah preached God's message, and he was persecuted and jailed and dropped in a muddy cistern, and God preserved him through it. John the Baptist the last and greatest of the prophets, preached repentance against Herod and his incestuous marriage, and Herod jailed him and later beheaded him at the daring of his uh, stepdaughter. Jesus himself preached the gospel, tried. He was tried and tortured and crucified. Christ promised us as his church that we would be persecuted. Jesus said, in John 15 and verse 20, Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. They will persecute you. Paul said it in Philippians 1.29 that persecution and suffering is granted to us by God. Don't ever let someone tell you that God will always spare his people whom he loves from suffering and persecution. That is not in the Bible, not anywhere. The reality, the truth of Scripture, Philippians 1, 29, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. That's persecution. But we know. We're absolutely convinced that God uses persecution for his own good purposes. That, that great verse again, we know that God causes all things to work together for good, even bad things by our estimation. He causes them to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purposes. That verse is, it should never be used by an unbeliever to say, see, everything's working together for good. I've had some of the most ungodly men I've worked with have looked at me and said, doesn't your Bible say this? See, it's all working together for good. Applying it to some completely non-Christian circumstance. No. He says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. So for us, the church who know and love and serve and worship the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that God is doing in your life now or whenever, is God is using it and working it together for good, according to his purposes. Preaching brings persecution caused by God for our good and his glory. I want you to notice in verse 1 of chapter 8, it says, They were all scattered. The word has as its root, the root word for seeds or seeds being scattered out like a farmer who spreads out the seeds with his hands that they might land in the ground and take root and grow up into grain. God uses persecution to scatter his church, to take and spread the gospel to the next stage from Jerusalem 
to Judea and Samaria. Listen, beloved, in our day, in our times, looking and watching what was going on downtown even yesterday, don't despair. Don't be discouraged at whatever the world leaders are doing. God is working all these things, persecution included, for our good. Beloved, don't be surprised. This is the tough part. Don't be surprised if there are some who hate us and our message. We love the Lord Jesus Christ. We love the gospel. We see the power of the gospel to so dramatically change you and I. And there's a, there's a sense in which we think everybody should just love the gospel. But there are some who hate it with a great hatred because the gospel exposes their deeds of darkness and makes them accountable to a God they don't want to admit exists. Beloved, don't be surprised if there are some who hate us and our message. Don't live this Christian life with the expectation that everybody will love us and our message when the gospel is correctly and biblically in the power of the Spirit preached, it will bring opposition and persecution. It's been doing that since the moment that Abel offered the right sacrifice to God and Cain was jealous over it. Right back then, what do we do? We pray. We plead with God that when it happens, we will all stand firm. We pray and plead with God, and in those moments of persecution, we'll know God's grace to keep us steadfast, following Christ without denying him right to the very bitter end. We pray that we will, like the apostles, rejoice that we have been considered worthy to suffer for the sake of Jesus' name. Gospel preaching brings persecution, which God is working for his good and his glory. Our good and his glory, too. Think about the church in Korea. The, the, the Western missionaries were removed, I think, back in the 20s, if I got my, my memory serves me correctly. And the Western church didn't hear much from the Korean church for years, 50, 60, 70 years, I think it was. And they thought it'll be all but stamped out. And when they went back and had a look, it had grown like a hundredfold or more, thousandfold. Huge growth in the church. As much as an anti-God government tried to stamp it out, it spread and grew and flourished and prospered. The church behind the Iron Curtain, as some here could tell you, is stronger than the church on the other side, the free side of the Iron Curtain for all those years. As much as the government tried to stamp it out, God caused it to flourish and grow. We've been crying out to God for revival in this country. Is it not possible, brothers and sisters, that God is going to bring revival in Australia and he'll do it by bringing persecution? A question that just makes my goosebumps. The hair in the back of my neck stand up on end is, am I willing to go through that persecution that the gospel might go forward? The people all over this country would come to know Christ as Savior. And that's not a question anybody can answer for you. That's a question you must answer and plead with God for the strength to answer it rightly. But notice, secondly, God uses gospel preaching to bring conversions. In the text, in verses 4 to 13, the church, except the apostles, are scattered everywhere preaching the word, preaching the gospel. And Philip travels to the city of Samaria, most likely the Old Testament city of Shechem. And notice the text in verse 5, he preached Christ to them. It's a shorthand way of saying he preached the incarnation of Christ, the life of Christ, his ministry, his suffering, his death and resurrection. He preached to them the whole story of the gospel. And what a great message the gospel is. It's a message worth repeating that God, most holy, all-powerful, all-knowing, had created from nothing all of existence with the purpose of glorifying himself through his creation. But we, you and I, us individually, who are created in God's image and likeness, have all sinned. 
We've all gone our own way. We've all rebelled against God. We've all failed to meet his standard of holy, righteous behavior. We've all crossed every line that God marked for how we're to behave. We having disobeyed, sorry, we having disobeyed and defied God are condemned to an eternal death under the unceasing righteous indignation of God. Connor and I were sharing this week just about hell. You say, why would two Christian brothers get together and share about hell? But that conversation went around to that, and you said, you know what? Often we have the idea that hell is an absence of God. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God is present there in hell. And men and women, young and old, who have rejected Christ and refused the gospel will spend an eternity in hell face-to-face with the unceasing, unwavering, righteous indignation of God. That's the bad news. But the good news is so much better. But God. But God sent his only son to be born of a virgin, truly God and truly man, to live in a perfect, sinless obedience. God his Father, to God his Father, God in grace sent Christ to live, teaching and preaching and healing sick and cleansing lepers and casting out demons and raising the dead. And God in grace sent Christ to suffer the unimaginable pain and isolation and humiliation of the cross as he paid the penalty for our sin, for your sin and for mine. In one of the most staggering verses in the Bible, Isaiah 53 and verse 10, it pleased the Lord to crush him. You want to know how much God loves you? Think of that. The father put the son under his foot and crushed him. And he did it for your for you and for me, to display his love for us, to display his righteous anger at sin, to display his grace to us, that we who do not have any right whatsoever to be with God, to be reconciled to God, he did it that he might reconcile us. Did you know, Christian, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have already traveled an infinite distance You say, what was that? It was a distance from sinner to saint. Because no human ever created could ever cost that distance on their own. It's only the grace and love and power of God that can bring us from sinner and make us saints. And he did it by crushing Christ for us. But it doesn't end there. God in the glory of victory raised Christ from the dead. God has exalted Christ to his right hand and given him the name that's above every other name at the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every knee will bow and every tongue will shout out and declare some in glory and worship and some in seething anger. They will still say he is Lord. That's the gospel. The Bible tells us in Acts 17 and verse 30, Truly, these times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. All men, including the Samaritans who heard Philip's message. The Samaritans had their own idea of a Messiah called Taheb. But Philip's preaching brought them to understand the true Messiah. Yes, the Spirit of God was at work. to open their understanding and help them realize who Jesus is. Philip's preaching was perhaps the completion of what Jesus began in his conversion with the woman at the well. Notice in verse 6, his preaching was validated by the signs he performed. And just as Elijah and Elisha's ministry had been validated by signs, and just as Jesus' own ministry had been validated with miracles and signs, as the Father attested to Christ through those things, so also Philip's message, his preaching, was validated by the signs he was performing or the Spirit was performing through him. 
The signs pointed beyond themselves to the true power of God to save. So why do we not have those signs and wonders anymore? We have instead the Spirit-inspired Word of God that's both the source and proof of our message. It validates our preaching. Hence Paul's clear imperative, which all those reformers carried out to preach the Word. But Notice the Samaritan's response. In verse 6, the Bible says, They heard, they heeded the message. They heard it with understanding, with intention to comply to the message. The Spirit of God opened their hearts and minds to believe. <clears throat> In verse 11, they believed Philip as he preached. They trusted God, the subject of his message. They relied on God as being absolutely true. In verse 12, both men and women were baptized. There was an immediate commitment to what they had heard. Baptism was their and our symbolic way of stating a complete renewal. The old had gone, the new had come. They publicly committed to Christ. There was joy in the city, which is the consistent natural response to the gospel is joy. Great gladness, great happiness, great thankfulness. It's the emotion of pleasure and delight. The gospel believed makes all things new. The gospel believed washes all the guilt of sin away. And the gospel believed brings a reality of completeness and nearness to God as no other message ever can. God uses preaching to bring conversions. But what about you? What about you and I? Do you know the truth of the gospel? Do you believe in God who is the subject, the, con the whole subject of the gospel is God himself? Are you striving, brother and sister, with all our might to no longer commit the sin that once completely estranged us from God? Brother and sister, rejoice in God. Rejoice in the gospel that Christ has saved you. Thirdly, I want you to notice the gospel preaching brings deliverance from darkness. Notice in verses 9 to 11, this man named Simon, or some of your Bibles have, may, may have Simon Magus, uh, had astonished these Samaritans. He kept them from believing, or sorry, kept them believing that he was the great power of God. Now, magic in the first century was usually done in secret, and certainly for the magician's benefit and probably not for the benefit of anybody else. Simon's magic could have been just common carnival trickery that he claimed as a true spiritual power or something far worse. Some of the Jewish teachers and leaders believed magic to be a genuine and dangerous sorcery used to manipulate spirits to control them, binding and loosing them through special knowledge to do the magician's will. Extra biblical sources, including a man named Justin Martyr, tell us that Simon was worshipped by many Samaritans as, and I quote, first God with a small g. There was even a cult established in his name called the Simonians, I believe they were. Uh, Justin Martyr himself actually belonged to that cult group before he was saved. Apparently, Simon himself went to Rome and he had a statue erected of himself titled Simon, a holy God. Now, whatever he truly was, he did hold the Samaritans in this city captive by his words and deceit. And for however long Simon held sway over the Samaritans, it all changed when Philip began preaching Christ and the kingdom of God. Philip's demonstration of the Holy Spirit's divine power to truly cast out demons, we see this in verse 7, and heal paralyzed and lame people, it showed so many it showed Simon up to be what he truly was, a, a, a fake, a fraud. And the Samaritans, once held captive to Simon, were set free. Why? Because the preaching of the gospel delivers from darkness. Whether we were ever involved in an occultic situation or occultic groups, or we were simply living in sinful disobedience, we were in darkness. Darkness. 
In Scripture, light always describes God, and darkness always describes what is against God, anti-God. The Bible says in Proverbs 2, that the wicked are those who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. In John 3, 19 and 20, Jesus said this, This is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. In Matthew 25 and verse 30, darkness describes the judgment and death. You know, I, but here's the great news. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2, the Bible says that God's salvation brings light to those in darkness. In Colossians 1.13, listen to this, brothers and sisters. Paul says that God has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his love, his dear son. The preaching of of the gospel delivers those who are in darkness. Brothers and sisters, preach, proclaim, make known the gospel of Christ, that Christ has suffered and died and risen, risen again, so God may shine the light of the gospel of Christ into others' hearts. When you preach, you say, I, I got a terrible voice. I, I can barely speak. I get so nervous. That doesn't matter. When you preach, when you speak, when you open your mouth and in a moment of terrified boldness, you begin to speak the gospel message. God uses that message to shine the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ into the hearts of those who are listening to awaken and open them to the truth of the gospel. So we preach it. We make it known. We share it. We do whatever we can to get the message out there. Christ died and rose again to bring us into the light of Christ. When others, like the Samaritans, hear the message and believe it and repent and follow Christ, they're set free and delivered from darkness. God uses the gospel for preaching, sorry, God uses gospel preaching for good to deliver us from darkness. What a joy this morning to gather together, knowing that we have been delivered out of darkness into the light of Christ, to know we have received that message. But brothers and sisters, in the same moment that we rejoice that we have come into the light and understood the light of the gospel, there are still millions upon millions of those who do not know that. They're still in darkness because of sin, because of their own sin. We need to get out there and make that message known. Fourthly and lastly, God uses gospel preaching to bring reconciliation. Notice in verses 14 to 17, we have this strange set of circumstances where those who had heard and believed did not receive the Holy Spirit until the apostles came and laid hands on them. And I've always wondered, why was that? Why was there sort of a, a seeming second persecu uh, persecution, persecution, second um, what's, what am I looking for, the word? Pentecost, that's the word. The sec, why was it seemingly a second Pentecost at Samaria? Why, why, why the delay? You and I, when we heard the gospel and we began to believe it, that moment we began to believe, we were filled with the Spirit of God. Why not these Samaritans? Why the delay? And I think the writer is getting across, and the truth of it is, that the church in Samaria was not a separate individual church outside and unrelated to the church of Christ in Jerusalem. The apostles in authority as Christ's authorized spokesmen and representatives, having all witnessed the resurrected Christ, held authority over his singular church. They came down and laid hands on those Samaritans who had believed and identified them as belonging to the same church that the Jews were part of. There is no difference between Jew and Samaritan and Gentile. They are all one in Christ. It displays that the Samaritan believers are included, accepted, and equally part of the church, as are the Jews in Jerusalem. The coming of the Holy Spirit at that moment displayed to all unity. 
But there's something more here. Notice that the Philip preached under the Holy Spirit's inspiration the gospel of Christ and the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now you see that down in verse number 12. When they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ and so on. Okay, so he preached about the kingdom of God and Christ. Here's a good question for you. How did Samaria come into existence? Now, those of you who know your Old Testament Bible history will go 931 years earlier, almost 1,000 years before this. In 1 Kings chapter 12, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, inherited the throne of Israel. And he went to Shechem. Where is Philip right now? He's most likely in the same place, in Shechem. Shechem is the same place that Philip is now preaching. Ten of the tribes of Israel, you remember the story, reject their rightful king Rehoboam, and instead they crowned Jeroboam as king. And when they did that, they divided the nation. You say, yeah, but God had promised the division of Israel as punishment for Solomon's sin. The king... Get this, the king came to his people in Shechem and they rejected him. And now in Acts chapter 8, almost a thousand years later in Shechem, the infinitely greater king of kings and lord of lords, the savior who is God himself is made known to the Samaritans as their rightful king. And the descendants of those 10 tribes bow the knee to Christ. To me, that's remarkable. Man's sin splits apart, but the gospel of grace in Christ Jesus reconciles and brings them back together again. Gospel preaching has reconciled those whom sin had divided. Jew and Samaritan are reconciled and reunited under Christ, the divided apostate nation turning to Christ, their Messiah, in faith and repentance, are reconciled to God and to each other. That's the great truth of the gospel. Reconciliation. But not just with God. I mean, that's great. But it isn't like Con got reconciled to God over there and I got reconciled to God over here and we're still warring away at each other. No, when there's reconciliation to God on both parts, as we're brought to God, we're brought together to each other. That's a great hope. Sin divides, but the gospel of Christ heals and reconciles. Praise God for the wonderful truth of Romans 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies, and we were We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. Bible says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now God has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. The gospel first and foremost brings reconciliation between God and man, but it also brings reconciliation between man and man. Brothers and sisters, you can go back to the church history. And you can see literally thousands of stories of families reunited and marriages and friendships restored. Relationships of every kind restored and reconciled when all parties to the dispute bow the heart, the will, and the knee to Christ and are reconciled. You say, wait a minute, what about that persecution? That wasn't reconciliation. No, it wasn't. Because those who love darkness will flee away from the light. Those who love darkness will try and destroy the light. And I love the hope we have from John chapter 1 that the darkness could not overcome. It could not overpower the light. The great hope we have in the gospel is the light of the gospel brings men together. Sin drives us apart. It brings us first to God, absolutely, but it also brings us together. Brothers and sisters, we preach the gospel of Christ to bring reconciliation to God and to each other. Brothers and sisters, consider the power of God to reconcile us. How great 
is the message, the truth, the hope of the gospel. Christ's blood shed, his life given so that we might be washed clean of all guilt and shame that sin brought. Christ's life given, his body entombed that we might have life, eternal life. Not merely existence. Brothers, do you realize? Again, Connor and I were talking in the middle of the week, talking about eternity. And we as human beings are designed to exist in time and space. So I hear people say, well, eternity's got nothing to do with time. It's something outside of time. And I think I probably said things similar myself. But I suddenly realized we were designed to exist in time and space. A hundred billion, trillion, trillion, trillion years from now, when eternity is just getting started, this will be an infinitely distant, dark memory. We'll know that we once were sinners and now we're saved by grace. We'll know that tremendous hope, that tremendous joy that we have. We'll be living in eternal life, not just existing in the four corners of this world, but existing in the essence of life. That's what the gospel is all about. That's why the gospel, even though God uses it like persecution. I had an idea for a demonstration, but I probably get everybody soaked. And basically put a big pan of water in the middle and you just go up and go whack on that pan of water. And when you do that, the water flies in every direction. And I'm absolutely convinced that God came in and used Saul and went whack right in the middle of the church in Jerusalem. And they spread out everywhere. You say, but some died. Yes, they went home to glory. But they were split apart. Yes, and everywhere they went, they scattered preaching the gospel. Brothers and sisters, Christ's blood was shed. His life was given so that we might be washed clean of all guilt and shame. Christ's life was given. His body was entombed that we might have life, not merely existence, but eternal life, the essence of what it means to be living. So preach the gospel, tell it, gossip it, share it, leave Bible verses around, hand out gospel, we're going to hand out some gospels of Luke, hand them out in whatever way God has equipped you, knowing that God will not allow his word to return void, preach the gospel, make it known. Preach the gospel in the the certain knowledge that at times it will bring a strong negative result that our listeners may respond with animosity, persecution, hatred, and even violence, yet in the certain knowledge that persecution cannot separate us from Christ. Brothers and sisters, preach the gospel in the certain knowledge that God has chosen to use the preaching, proclaiming of the good news of Christ as a means to bring men and women out of darkness into the light to saving faith in Christ. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Brothers and sisters, one of the marks of the Reformation was that we don't preach in the faint hope that some might believe. We preach in the certain hope, the certainty that some will be saved. Because God is faithful to save when the gospel is preached. Preach the gospel, beloved, in the certain knowledge that God uses the preaching of the gospel to deliver men and women from the domain of darkness the darkness of despair, of false beliefs, of false hopes, and bring them into the truth of Jesus Christ. The gospel. It's the greatest news ever proclaimed anywhere. Let's pray. Would you stand with me and we'll pray together. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the gospel message. The message of hope, the message of life, the message of freedom from darkness. Father, we thank you for that day, each one of us in our own hearts. That day, that moment when the lights went on and we understood that I am a sinner. A great sinner against a holy God. But God has sent Jesus to die in my place, to take the punishment I deserved, 
to be separated, cut off, and isolated, to be crushed under the foot of his father, that his father might adopt me and call me his own. Father, we thank you and we praise you as a company of believers. Oh God, we thank you for what you have done through the gospel message in our lives. And Father, we look around, look at this world, and Father, there is a desperate need for the gospel to be made known. Father, I cry out to you for this church, for each of us in this room and all those who are watching online and on Zoom. Father, I pray, I plead with you, O oh God, that you would do a work in our hearts to greatly change us and use us for the preaching of the gospel. Father, for those listening who do not know what it means to be truly saved, Father, we plead with you. We ask you, O oh God, by the power of the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of their hearts and their minds to understand the truth. Father, give them the faith to believe. Draw them close. Open their eyes. Father, push them down onto their knees that they might repent and believe and know what it is to be saved. Father, we pray too for Lee as he's coming next week. Lord, we're excited about a series of messages on witnessing and what it means and how it works. Father, we pray for him that you'd encourage him and strengthen him as he prepares and plans and studies and prays. Father, may he have a great joy in his own heart as he prepares for the month of preaching here. Father, we pray that you would be all that he needs. Father, we ask you that you would teach and feed and encourage the church. Lord, we ask you all these things in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.